Hey booktube, it's Peg. Welcome back to the History Shelf. Today we are talking used books. Um, over the last several weeks I have purchased several used books from different third-party sellers, thrift books, whatnot. There is no rhyme or reason to the topics or the books I've collected. They're just books I've either wanted for a while and finally got or they were impulse. And sometimes those are the most fun. Um, anyway, so let's dive right in because I'm making a lot of videos today. I've got to make up a lot of time. All right, so this first book um, was on my list of books to get because I read a biography of um, Henry David Thoreau last year with John David, Sharon Goforth, and Hannah at Hannah's Books. Uh, it was a biography by Laura Dasso Walls, and it was a fantastic uh, biography, but it introduced me to, you know, amongst his circle of friends, um, this woman really stood out and I wanted to know more about her. So I finally got around to picking this one up. This is Paula Blanchard's Margaret Fuller from Transcendentalism to Revolution. Now this was written, excuse me, this was written in 1978. Um, so it's an older book, but this is in great condition. Um, got it for like five or six bucks. I think of, uh, thrift books, but um, in case you don't know, Margaret Fuller was a, she was a 19th century woman of letters who was a, an intimate um, friends with Emerson, Thoreau, Channing, a whole slew of people um, that were known as the Transcendentalists. Um, and in this book, it kind of focuses on the woman as, as she struggled to attain her, her education and also how it took her to um, a road to revolution in a sense. She had a very, very what you would call romantic life, um, you know, very extraordinary, you would say. Um, but it says here, so Margaret Fuller's, you know, lonely struggle to educate herself and become a writer against a siege of Victorian domestic duties, as well as the prevailing social dictates has renewed significance today. Now, of course, this book was written in 78. Um, so you still have like the feminist movement going on. And I think that was, you know, kind of probably a, a big focus there. Yeah, but it's always relevant, you know, to know how a woman um, balanced her, her uh, intellectual aspirations with marriage, family, children, that type of thing. Uh, let's see. Paula Blanchard brings a wealth of fascinating new detail to her full-scale biography. We see Margaret reading Latin and Greek with her father at a time when most children are in kinder kindergarten. Uh, while studying German, classical literature, and philosophy, she was also being educated as a, quote, lady, unquote. And the conflict between these two roles, complicated by her own passionate nature, was to hound her for life. Margaret Fuller's years in New England as a teacher, writer, and editor of the transcendentalist magazine The Dial were followed by a job as the first woman journalist on Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. The final years of her short life as a partisan of the revolution in Italy and a familiar of Carlisle, Mazzini, and Mikowitz were to astonish and scandalize her New England contemporaries. In these explosive Roman years, she took an aristocratic lover, a Sully, and bore him a child. Her pregnancy and confinement in a lonely hill town during the revolution are portrayed by Blanchard with deft psychological insight. Um, so yes, I'm kind of looking forward to this. Um, yeah, picked it up for a song. Uh, if any, any of you are out there aware of another biography on uh, Margaret Fuller or any type of uh, ancillary books about her, please let me know. I'd like I'd really like to know more about her. She really intrigued me from the biography I read on Thoreau. Okay, so the next book I saw uh, was triggered in my mind by Johnny Keene. He was showing um, some of the, you know, his spiritual books that he reads. And um, I have a few of these in the series. It's the Classics of Western Spirituality series. Um, but I wanted to get this one. I, I have a couple. I think I have the one on Hildegard van, von Bingen and a couple of others, but this one is called Anglo-Saxon, hello, this is called Anglo-Saxon Spirituality, Selected Writings. Uh, this is put out by Paula's Press, they have an entire series, they're always putting out new titles. Um, it's a very broad uh, scope 
of what they include in their in their classics of uh, Western spirituality. But this one covers uh, like it's an anthology of sermons, homilies, and poems uh, written by Anglo-Saxons during like six from 660 to 1066. Uh, the sermons that celebrate the lives of the saints, um, like John the Baptist and the apostles, and also native-born Anglo-Saxons like King Oswald of Northumbria and the hermit Guthlac of Crowland. Um, the poems, let's see, notable among the poems are, are Cadman's Hymn, the earliest surviving poem written in English, The Phoenix, an allegorical explanation of the mythical self-immolating bird, and The Dream of the Rood, a poetical recounting of a visionary experience. Um, so, yeah, um, oh, that's nice. They have a, they have a, a homily on the birth of John the Baptist, which it already said that here. We've got one on, uh, like the dedication of St. Michael's Church, the Blickling homily. I think I saw one for St. Andrew, which is why I made that sound. I used to go to a church named St. Andrew's. Um, anyway, I like this kind of stuff because... Uh, when I read this, it, it, I feel connected to Christians from centuries and centuries ago. Um, and I feel, I feel like it's important for me to realize how long <laughs> my religion, my faith has been around. And, and to know that, you know, uh, I'd like to know what they sang, the poems they read, the things that they, you know, studied for their own spiritual uplift and to reinforce their faith, which helps me you know, and my faith. So, um, I love reading the, the more, the, the older homilies and, uh, sermons, uh, you know, even if it's the antiquated writing, I don't care. I, I feel like, you know, I get, I'm getting a window into the past, you know, and as a historian, I love that. Um, so I got, you know, Anglo-Saxon spirituality. I mean, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm kind of old fashioned that way. Um, Back when I was going to church, when it was safe to go to church, you know, um, I I liked I liked the service that had the music that was old fashioned and, and like hymns and a choir. Um, I'm not so much into the jazz band, you know, the uh, the people with electric guitars and the drums and and most of the times they can't play the music, they can't play the instruments. You know, it's a beautiful thing that you want to get, you want to play the music, but at the same time, you, you have to, to me, it's like you need to play well. Um. <laughs> I don't mean to sound bad, you guys, but did you ever notice that? Whoever's gone to church and someone in the band is playing and the, 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 the piano is going off key and the, the people can't sing or the, I don't know, it's just... It drives me, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit more of a, a traditionalist and I'm a stickler. Like, you know, you, 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 you want to send up something pleasing to the Lord. <laughs> I mean, I know the heart, the intention is, yes, you want to worship, and that's great. Anyway, I got off on a tangent. Um, but yeah, and I think that's why I like the hymns, because everyone's pretty much singing the same thing. Like, you know, kind of like, mm, you know, it's hard to screw up. It's hard to screw up. But I do love a good choir. So there's that. Okay. Uh, another book I picked up. Uh, when this came out, I wanted to read it. And it's a couple of years. It's, it's a couple of years old. Um, sometimes I like to read these. Sometimes I don't. This came out in 2019. This is uh, Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization by Samuel Gregg. This is put up by Regnery Gateway. Um... It's just your standard kind of a defense of uh, reason combined with faith and that um, the two should go together. And when they're separated, both of those things can go seriously off the tracks. Um, but, I mean, there's a lot of philosophy in here. Uh, it's a small little volume. I don't know. I just, I, it was a whim. I picked it up on a whim. Thought, I thought I thought Martine was going to sneeze, but apparently not. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I just, I heard the intake of breath and I was waiting for the sneeze -it, sneezage. Still alive, people. She's still alive, people. Uh, 
thanks to Martine, I've got another nifty microphone, but it's not just nifty. She says this is superior quality. So please tell me if the sound is sounding better. Oh, don't tell her. Don't tell her because I can't afford it anymore. Yeah, don't. Okay. She can't afford it anymore. I didn't. She, she surprised me with this microphone. I didn't ask for it, but thank you. But um, if it does work well, um, it will be thanks to Bill Rutenberg um, for prompting the suggestion from his daughter about... Oh, right. Thanks to Bill Rutenberg the, about... Sorry, we're going off on a little yeah, sidetrack here, but... Um, yes, we were having issues with the sound quality or the sound levels in one of my videos, and... Um, you know, I'm in a buddy read with Bill Rutenberg, and we were communicating on Voxer, um, and was talking about the the levels, and you know, trying to fix it. And and his his daughter Crimson, I believe, had told him, you know, well, what kind of microphone does she have? Is it a podcast microphone? Because if it is, you have to be right up on it, you know, and it it won't pick up extraneous sounds really well. So so thank you, Bill and Crimson, and thank you for helping us just try to find different ways to come at this problem because in in the event we were able to find this microphone which hopefully I tested it and it sounds really good so uh, let me know everyone if it sounds all right okay moving on 11 minutes ah, pressure okay so another impulse buy I was watching a Steve Donahue video um, and I can't remember which book he got in the mail. Oh, I know. No, it was a, I think it was a Brattle. He went, he had a Brattle book haul. And the, I don't believe it. <laughs> you don't believe what, Martine? That, that it was a Brattle book haul. You don't believe? I've never heard such a thing from she, She's I'm never sure. heard of, <coughs> pardon me. Um, he had it from Steve, yeah. She, uh, so he picked up a, a biography on William James and he was talking about, um, and then he showed, aha, oh yes, this reminds me, I have another book coming in the mail. Thanks to you, Steve. Um, he showed a book um, on Ralph Waldo Emerson by the same author and I ended up buying that one used, it hasn't arrived yet. Anyway, but he mentioned something about the Metaphysical Club and he really enjoyed that book and I'm like, have I read that? I know I've seen the cover a million times. And I don't think I had re uh, read it, you know, read it. So, let me get this dang microphone here. Okay, so I picked this up used for a real good price. The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America by Louis Menand. Um, it's the story of... Story runs through the lives of Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., a Civil War hero who became the dominant legal thinker of his time, his best friend is young man, William James, right? Son of an eccentric moral philosopher, brother of a great novelist, and the father of modern psychology in America, and the brilliant and troubled logician, scientist, and founder of semiotics, Charles Sanders Pierce. Together, they belonged to an informal discussion group that met in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1872 and called itself the Metaphysical Club. The club was probably in existence for only nine months and no records were kept. The one thing we know that came out of it was an idea. An idea about ideas, about the role beliefs play in people's lives. This idea informs the writings of these three thinkers. In the work of the fourth figure in the book, John Dewey, student of Pierce, friend and ally of James, admirer of Holmes. So the metaphysical club begins with the Civil War and ends in 1919 with the Supreme Court decision in U.S. versus Abrams the basis for the modern law of free speech. It tells the story of the creation of ideas and values that change the way Americans think and the way we live. So, doesn't that sound great? You know, I, I'm just surprised I have not read this yet. Um, but thanks to that vi that video, you know, when I, I, I was trying to look for that biography on William James, it's pretty pricey, even used. But I was able to get the, uh, the bio on uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson I'm trying to remember the name of that writer but that Steve mentioned. But anyway, I decided I wanted to get a copy of this. And um, this would probably be good to read in, in conjunction with the, relatively, the, the new biography of um, Oliver Wendell Holmes that came out last year by Stephen Budiansky. I do remember that. 
Thank you. I'm just stacking books. As you can see, there's a little bit of movement on my bookshelves down below. Um, I've, I've made room for some brand new books that are, as you can see, they're not, they're not actually shelved because that, that'll be a future video, book haul video. Um, but it's probably going to, it's going to be a two-parter. That's another big one. Okay. So this book right here, boy, I have been trying for a year and a half to get a review copy when it was new. The lady said she would send it to me. She never did. I sent her an email again. She goes, oh, I never sent that. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me send it to you. She never did. <laughs> so I was like, I get the picture. I'm just going to buy this. Um, you know, me with my, uh, my military, uh, you know, uh, uh, affiliation and interests and, uh, I've always been intrigued by submarines because I would never want to be in one. So it fascinates me, the people that choose that line of work or in war were assigned to be, uh, submariners and this kind of stuff. Um, but this is the massive study. This came out, I, remember, I first saw it on booktube before I even had a channel. I think it was either on Steve's channel or David Murphy's or someone's, but it's the deadly deep by Ian Ballantyne, people. The definitive, definitive history of submarine warfare. It is a beast. Now, yeah, I can't seem to, I need to get this sticker off here. I was able to get the one off here. This book arrived in a gross Mylar cover. I mean, it was gnarly. Uh, I didn't even want to touch it. I immediately pulled out the scissors and ripped that thing off. You know, so at least I have the original dust jacket. So it's not dirty. But, you know, it's a very loose book. Um, I, I, would, uh, I, I know. It's a book with a reputation. That is just judgy. Don't be judgy. I'm judgy. I'm sorry. I judge books. This was, It's a little loose. The, the binding is not as tight as I would like. But... She's just friendly. <laughs> Should be friendly for the price, but look at that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little... Uh, but you know what? I think I paid seven bucks. And that's, I think it's out, it is out in paperback, but I wanted this in hardcover because there's another book by Ian Ballantyne that is available new. Check it out, people. On bargain. Oh, no, sorry. Bookoutlet.com. And it's in my cart. And I need to pull the trigger before they run out of stock. But he has like a follow-up to this book. And it's, I think it's called The Under Undersea or Underwater Warriors. Um, and it's about Britain's, it focuses mostly on just on Britain's, um, underwater, like submarine service. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to get his follow-up book, but I was like, I still wanted to get Deadly Deep. So I was just tired of waiting for, for the lady to send me the book. And so I was like, I, I will buy it used until I can get a, a, you know, a nicer hardcover. Who knows? Maybe it'll come around. I don't have a brattle to go to, but, um. Sometimes I find things online. Anyway, so nice, big, awesome book on submarine warfare. Chock-a-block full of photos, artwork, you name it. Um, if you're into this kind of stuff, I know I am. I'm a big military, military geek. So I got that, and I was really excited. Um, so you know what, though? I think the last several books in this used book haul these do have a rhyme and reason and I mentioned in another video um, that I'm reading a book on the Soviet uh, prosecution team at Nuremberg at the Nuremberg trials and uh, it's a great history um, about you know just 100 pages left to go um, love it and I'll do a review on this channel but uh, some of the people that she quotes in there are writers who were at the trials and, uh, and one of them was Janet Flanner. And I remember Janet Flanner from when I read a book called, oh God, or what was it, the documentary? It was called like Paris Was a Woman. I think it was a book and then they turned it into a documentary like Women of the Left Bank or something like that. Um, for the longest time in my teens and 20s, it was like my favorite documentary. And I think they interviewed Janet Flanner. She was still alive. And I can remember, I can remember seeing her face on the documentary. If anyone remembers that, let me know in the comments below. But, um, but like Paris was a woman was a great book. And, um, 
So she's quoted in the Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg book because she was watching those trials. And I was like, how fascinating. Well, she's known to have these journals. And so, and well, and this is the one it was quoted from. So I picked this up used. It's, it's not the best condition. I mean, but it's old. You know what I mean? It's yellow. Well, not yellow, but it's kind of dirty. This is Janet Flanner's World, Uncollected Writings, 1932 to 1975. Edited by Irving Drutman. Introduction by William Sean. Um, so it does cover her time at Nuremberg. Uh, let's see, she's got a letter from Warsaw in here. Yeah, I, I'm really intrigued. I, I bought it because I wanted her chapter, or this chapter, on um, her take on the Nuremberg trials. Uh, oh, yeah, this looks great. This looks fantastic. Um, talks about Goering and how he was just I mean the book that I'm reading is just again you know me rabbit hole peg right it takes me down the rabbit hole and uh, <laughs> so it's like um, yeah I want to I wanted to get her take on on the defense witnesses and and the defendants and um, she was a very very witty woman with really keen keen uh, intellect from, from everything I remember from the from the books I read and the um, documentary. So this one is just like uncollected writings, right? I, I, I've made a list of her journals, um, but I think, so I started with this one. This is Janet Flanner's uh, Paris Was Yesterday. This is 1925 to 1939. Uh, Edited by Irving Drutman again. I don't, oh, this must be. No. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I love reading people's journals. I mean, I have a bunch of Virginia Woolf's journals, uh, her collected letters, and I love letters, which is going to lead me into the next set of the two books that I'll show you. Um, but she covers a ton of different stuff in here. You know, her take on like. Shaw loves Russian ballet. Um, Emil Zola. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I oh, his wretched life, right? <laughs> Ulysses, Colette, um, Josephine Baker. Uh, wow. Nineteen thirty-four. Crime. Marlena Dietrich, Mae West. She has got little snippets on everybody in here. Anyone who is ever anyone. So, um, oh, because this is where she was really known. Let me just for those of you who are not familiar with Janet Flanner, in 1925, Janet Flanner began dispatching her famous New Yorker. So she wrote for the New Yorker, uh, her letter from Paris, from which most of the pieces in this collection are drawn. Together, they give in this together they give an incomparable view of French political social and cultural life in the years between the electrifying debut of Josephine Baker and the evacuation of Paris at the outbreak of war. Uh, Flanner writes with equal eloquence of Isidore Duncan's art, Stavisky's swindling, and the Munich Accord. She registers the impact of Americans on Paris, Lindbergh, May West, Hemingway, and marks the passing of the great and near great from Ravel and La Goulou, I don't know how to pronounce that name, to Clemenceau and um, Mademoiselle Curie. Some of her most riveting reports deal with crimes of passion, and she tells little-known facts about the chief executioner of France and the heartbreaking exodus from Spain into France during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, yeah, so in a sequence of dazzling vignettes and essays, Paris is captured in its golden hour. So I picked that up used. This is uh, Harcourt, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich. Jovanovich. That's kind of cool. <laughs> Jovanovich. All right. And so what I didn't know was that, well, I maybe I thought, maybe I knew she was. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But um, this is a book by William Murray about Janet Flanner and his mother because they were a couple. Did not know this. Uh, this is Janet, My Mother and Me, a memoir of growing up with Janet Flanner and Natalia Denise Murray by William Murray. So isn't that nifty? Um, Janet, My Mother and Me is a charming, captivating memoir about a boy, 
growing up in a household of two extraordinary women. William Murray was devoted to his mother, Natalia Denise Murray, and to his mother's longtime lover, writer Janet Flanner. Even as a teenager, he accepted their unconventional relationship. His portrait of the two most important people in his life is unforgettable. Uh, Janet Flanner was already celebrated as the author of a new style of personal journalism for her letter from Paris in The New Yorker when she met the Italian-born Natalia Murray on Fire Island, New York in 1940. Their encounter, writes uh, William Murray, was a coup de foudre. I don't, it's not a coup de force, it says foudre. That's really what it feels like. Uh, that's quite the way to meet. <laughs> a coup de foudre, a thunderbolt that instantly sent them rushing into each other's arms and forever altered their lives, as well as mine. Ah. Murray was already growing up in two cultures on different continents, in New York and Rome, when his mother's life changed so dramatically. He quickly accepted Flanner and the unusual household in which he found himself. Natalia's mother, Mamina Esther, also lived with them in New York. His memories of the women and of his own boyhood and adolescence are touching and often hilarious. So I thought that sounded just delightful. Uh, you know, just someone who uh, was happy and uh, I, I, I love it. Oh, that's a nice picture. Oh, that's sweet. Anyway. Who doesn't love a good uh, memoir about their childhood, especially if it wasn't uh, messed up? <laughs> especially if they really, you know, were fine growing up. Um, and then this one. Oh, I had to look around for this. It brings out the romantic in me. So there is a book of the, of the letters between Janet Flanner and Natalia. And it's called, and it looks like it was put together by Natalia after Janet died or something, but I don't know. It's called Darling, Darling, His, Darling Hissima, Letters to Her Friend, Janet Flanner, uh, edited and with commentary by Natalia Denise Murray. So. Oh, and it came in it. There's a little bookmark in here. As, you know, I ordered this used, and then I just, there's a little bookmark just sitting in there for me. Um, so I love letters. I love reading the letters. I've read the letters of Virginia Woolf to like Vita Sackville West and Vita Sackville West to um, oh you can't you know I can't believe I'm forgetting her name but Violet was it Violet Keppel? Yeah, that was crazy. Um, anyway, but. Uh, this is so neat. They're, I just, you're reading these letters that they wrote to each other. Let me give you a little snippet. It's all so sweet and nice. Oh. Let, me, let me find a, a, a good one here. I said like June 20th, 1944. Darling, I am almost out of pain for the first time since you left. My room here, high up, gives me a direct view over the White House Park onto the Jefferson Memorial where we stood and which I carry in duplicate with me, the photo of my preference now. You before his grand statue that last day here is by my side now. I feel very close because I can identify you more here than at any time since you left. I don't know why it is true, but it is true. Aww. Isn't that nice? It's beautiful. Anyway, so it's a collection of letters. Um, <clears throat> and I guess the darling Hissima was a word of Janet Flanner's invention, a special term of endearment for her closest friend made up of the English darling and the Italian superlative suffix. Um, this loving and original salutation with which Flanner opened many of her letters to Murray symbolizes perfectly what, what this book is about. Oh, I see what's going on here. An extraordinary friendship between two women from two different cultures living on two continents, yet entirely devoted to each other. Um, are you, oh, sorry. I did not break the spine that time, guys. Okay, so this is an old book, right? It's an old Random House book. This came out. <laughs> I 
1985. Now, I can tell you, I remember the moment when I think people actually started being, like, talking openly about the existence of homosexuals. <laughs> it was after 1990, at least in my life, where it, began, it, would, it, where it became a thing like, oh, hey, people have rights that are gay, you know? Wow, I never thought that that could be a thing. Well, so this was in 1985, and so this whole book is saying that the devoted friends, they were a couple, okay? I mean, even her son just said that it was, but this is an older book, you know, this is an older book, and so they, they're couching it, letters to a friend. Okay, well, times they have a changed. But either way, I'm glad to have a copy of this book with the letters. Um, I'm happy to have her, her uncollected writings. Um, I'm going to dive back into those. And I think I do have a biography. She was also known as Genet, um, G-E-N-E-T. Uh, Janet Flanner was known as Jeanne um, when she was writing in France. Um, anyway, so uh, I read a biography on her. It was ages ago, and I don't know where that book is now. But um, So I'm glad to have that. It's a little bit beat up, but you can't find it anywhere else. I got her first journal here. She has others, and I want to get those as well. Um, she was a fascinating lady. All right, so we're at 31 minutes, and I have more videos to make. So those were just some of my used um, books that I have hauled for whatever reason or um, impulse that I had. Please let me know what you think below in the comments. i um, happy to hear. Oh, you know what? Let me just, go. you know what? No, <laughs> just get more books and they're, they're new. So I'll save them for another video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm going to wrap this one up so I can upload it. But in the meantime, BookTube, hope you're having a great Saturday and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.